morning, everybody. Here I am on the church stage. There you are in your home. Um, I know you can't wait to see me every Sunday morning, and I can't wait to talk to you back. My mom always said I had face for the TV. My dad always said I had face for the radio, so I'm not sure what that means. But it is so good to see you this morning. We want to make sure that you are aware of just a couple different things. Uh, first off is this, is every Tuesday morning, Pastor William posts videos uh, to his Facebook page, and those are great ways to connect. Um, so kind of the, the weekly charge, if you will, the weekly devotion uh, for the week. So make sure you check that out uh, Tuesday morning. Of course, we've got Zoom meetings for the kids um, in just a few hours, 2 o'clock, and make sure you check that out. Katie has already sent out information on that. Uh, youth, we connect every single day somehow, some way, whether it be through social media, Zoom, or something. Um, so make sure you follow our pages uh, for more information on that. And then, of course, the women meet uh, Wednesday night uh, through Zoom as well. Um, this is kind of uh, weird, I would, like it is every single week, uh, just to, well, here I am, an empty church, um, but again, like always, we do not worship in an empty place, because we know that, that God is here, and one thing that, when I think about worship, this is what I think about, I think about us allowing God to come into us, so when he does that, then we can begin to see his glory then we can begin to see what he has for us. Now, what I want to do, if it's okay with you, I'm going to read um, here. I was in doing uh, my devos, and, and this kind of came across and made me think a little bit. John 4, uh, 23 says this. says, Yet it, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. And if we're going to read on to verse 24, it says, it says, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. And, and the phrase that I really thought about was true worshipers. Yet a time has come when the true worshipers will worship the church. Folks, if we're not true worshiping God now, we will never truly worship God now because we're worshiping in a completely different way. But here's the thing. You notice it didn't say when the true worshipers come inside the church, then God will be here. No, we just have to worship the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is not in a church. It's in your heart. It's everywhere. You carry that around. And so you just don't carry that around on a Sunday morning from 10 to 1130. You just don't carry that around um, when it's time to, to read your daily devotion. You carry it around in the grocery store that you're going to. You carry it around at the job you go to. You carry it around everywhere you go. And when the true worshipers worship, I believe that God's truth will be shown. I believe that 100%. Why? Because I see have seen that with my own eyes. Folks, if we're not true worshiping God now, we won't when Sunday morning gets back in session. We won't when the church doors open back up. Oh, we might sing. Oh, we might follow along, take notes in the sermon, but you're not worshiping. You're just going through your daily routine. God help us if our worship becomes a daily routine because we're not being true worshipers and we will never see the Spirit and we will never get to experience the truth that God has for us. So this morning as we go and you're watching this, I don't know how you're watching it, but however you're watching it and we are watching it, guys, can we be true worshipers this morning? Can we get rid of distractions? Can we not worry about that we're not in a church? Can we not worry about other distractions that come? About what sermon might be preached or what song might be sung? Can we just act like that we're here to worship God and not our agenda? Can we do that this morning? Because I promise you, you want truth shown in your life. You want the spirit to show up in your life. That only happens through true worship. We've got to pray right now. God, we love you so much. God, today, at this moment, may we become true worshipers. May we become worshipers, God, that 
not are we worshiping our agenda, but God, we're worshiping the fact that we don't have to be in a church. We don't have to be in a, in a social setting for your spirit to be here. We're worshiping the fact and we're praising the fact that, God, that you are with us every day of our lives. Thank God for the tomb because if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't get to experience that. Thank God for the heartaches in our life because sometimes if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't get to experience that. We're getting deep now. And, God, I know this. I know your word promises us that you will show up. And not only will you show up, you'll show out. God, we desperately want you to show out this morning. Because you've promised you'll show up. And in our living rooms, in our homes, wherever we're at, as we become true worshipers, we get to see your spirit and we get to see your truths. We get to see your glory and as you show out, Oh, God, may we, may we become a posture of worship. Not with our minds, but with our hearts. Because that's where it begins. You've got something to say. And I'm going to stop talking, so you'll say it. For we ask it in your name. Amen. Yes, we are gathered here and wherever you are to worship him to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, to see him with fresh eyes. And I can't help but think that we've been given an opportunity to do that as we worship in a different place. So as we worship him and as we exalt him this morning, wherever you are, I encourage you to open the eyes of not just what you see with, but open the eyes of your heart and invite him to reveal himself to you in ways that you've never seen him before. Let's worship him today.
that this morning. That there is absolutely none beside our God. And that though the darkness of what you may be walking through may hide your vision from him, that's why we pray, oh God, open the eyes of our hearts. Because we want to see you. We want to see the truth of who you are. We don't want to miss who you are and who you are showing us that you are and who you are showing us that we are. Because that's when change takes place. When we see the Lord, we can't help but worship him. We can't help but fall upon our face and cry out to him to speak of his holiness and to pray this prayer that simply says open our eyes Lord we want to see Father, we pray that prayer, and we admit that that's a dangerous prayer to pray, because when we ask you to show us yourself, you'll do it, and it may not come in a way that we expected. We want to see you high and lifted up, shining in all of your glory, but sometimes in order to see you shining, the things of earth have to grow strangely dim. Maybe you have to confine us to our homes so that we're not distracted by those things that we love. And God, if we're honest, we must confess that sometimes it looks like you're not there at all. It gets very quiet and very lonely and very dark. But God, you are there. You haven't left. You're still as bright as the morning sun. Oh God, we pray that we would see you shining in the light of your glory. And that even when we don't see you, that we would know that you're still even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Because you never stop. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Come on, proclaim it.
this with one other person. And if you're not with one other person, God is there with you, and he deserves your praise. And I want you to pause right now in this very moment and think of one way he has been your way maker. I'm not talking about because he made a way and he died on the cross. That's the way he's been all of our way makers. But I believe we serve and worship a personal God who is intimately acquainted with your situation and is at work behind the scenes. I want you right now in this moment as an act of worship to tell the Lord, and if you're with one other person, to give testimony to how he has been the way maker in your life this past week. Will you just do that right now, wherever you are? Because it does our spirits good to recall what we have seen and heard and handled and tasted of him. How has he been your way maker? appropriate words those are that David wrote in the 27th Psalm so long ago that are so important for any day, but particularly in the times we're living in now. God has given us peace over fear and hope over despair. We're going to count on his promises today as we go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful today for your continual presence in our lives, and we thank you for the promise of peace and hope, and thank you for being our light and our salvation. May that light rest in the heart and in the home of each person that's watching this video right now and worshiping with us. And may you speak peace to our hearts and deliver us from any fear or anxiety that might be hounding us this day. And let peace reside in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're going to look at one of the parables that our Lord told. It's in the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to call it a tale of two prayers. He tells a parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector in Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 9. It says that Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. If you were to ask the people in Jesus' day who lived in Israel, what group of people was considered to be the most moral and holy and upright people, then they would have said the Pharisees. They were the prestigious religious group of that day. 
On the other hand, if you would have asked people during Jesus' day what group was considered to be the most dishonest, underhanded, and cold-hearted people, then they would have said the tax collectors. Because the tax collectors extracted taxes from their fellow countrymen to feed the coffers of Rome and to line their own pockets. But astonishingly, Jesus tells a story where the tax collector comes out smelling like a rose and the Pharisee stinks to high heaven because the tax collector walks away justified while the Pharisee is condemned. That Jesus would even tell such a story where the tax collector comes out the hero and the Pharisee the goat uh, had to be shocking to the ears of the people who were listening. Jesus' parables, even though they're 2,000 years old, still hold so much relevance to our modern times. And we're going to walk through this parable, examine the characters involved, and see what lessons the Lord has for us through this great story. I want to start with the Pharisee. The Pharisee was a self-righteous man of pride. It's evident in this story that arrogance and cockiness just filled his heart, and it's evident in several ways. First of all, the Pharisee had a good eye on himself. I really should say he had too good of an eye on himself. And all he saw were his good qualities, and he boasted of them very freely. Remember in Romans 12 and verse 3 where the Apostle Paul is writing, and he says that we ought not think more highly of ourselves than we ought? Well, the Pharisee certainly thought more highly of himself than what he should have. And as a result, he was basically the kind of person who would strut his religion. You know, when I think of somebody who struts, you know, they got their chest out and they're walking with this swag, you know, and they got this cocky air about them. And that's how the Pharisees were. In fact, Jesus even spoke of them in Matthew chapter 6 when he talked about how they would pray out on the street corners so everybody would see them. And that was the kind of people that they were. They wanted to flaunt their religion. But self-righteousness is a disgusting thing, particularly in the eyes of God. I was listening to John Hagee preach a number of years ago, and and he made this statement. He said, I would rather go fishing with a foul-mouthed, tobacco-chewing, no-good bum than walk across the street with a pompous, proud, self-righteous religionist. I heard that, and I thought, come on, John, tell us how you really feel, you know. I mean, that's just kind of how that type of person sits with you. It just It's disgusting. And that's the kind of person that this Pharisee was. He had too good of an eye on himself, and his arrogance shined through. But also notice the second thing about this Pharisee. He had a bad eye on others. You look at his prayer, and he, he says, I thank you that I'm not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And he starts comparing himself to this tax collector. You know, it's a dangerous game to play, comparing yourself to other people. You can't win either way. And here in this situation, the Pharisee is comparing himself to someone that he perceives to be worse than he is. And when you do that, the result is that You don't get a true picture of yourself, and you come out feeling and looking better than you really are. Just imagine this scenario. Suppose you got this this guy, and let's say he's not a really good husband. I mean, he doesn't give attention to his wife. He's neglectful of his kids. And they're still all together, but he just doesn't really enrich their lives, you know. And he sees a story on television where there's a, a husband who beats his wife, and he hears about another husband who's a deadbeat dad, you know, he's run off. And he looks over at his wife and says, now aren't you glad I'm not like that? I'm a pretty good husband compared to those guys. But I ask you, is he a good husband? 
Just because he's better than those guys in his eyes doesn't mean he's still a good husband. It doesn't change the reality that he's not an enriching experience or a, a personality at home. And he can still be difficult to live with and, and maybe not even provide for his family. But because he's comparing himself to people who he perceives as being worse than he is, it makes him feel better about himself, gives him a false picture of who he is, and makes him look better than what reality says he is. And it's especially dangerous spiritually when we compare ourselves to other people because we look down from our high tower on other people and we condemn them all as sinners and we start feeling that we're all this holier-than-thou kind of person forgetting that the Bible says there is none that doeth good. No, not one. And later in Romans 3 where Paul says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we're all sinners and none of us has the right to look at others and condemn them and consider ourselves better and not in need of mercy. The one we need to compare ourselves to is God and His holy standard, His perfect standard, then we'll realize that we have all sinned and we've all strayed from the Lord and we all need mercy and we all need forgiveness. Someone made this statement one time. A mountain shames a molehill until both are humbled by the stars. You see, it'd be easy for a mountain to feel itself greater than the molehill because he's so large. But when you look up at the sky and you see the stars, the mountain really sees his insignificance in comparison. And that's how we are. We might look at the other people and say, well, I'm a lot better than that person. I don't do the things that person does. And we start, might, think, might start thinking that we're all righteous and holy. But what we need to do is look at God and compare ourselves to that standard. And then we see our uncleanness and our need to be cleansed and redeemed. It's a dangerous thing to do what this Pharisee did and compare yourself to other people. Well, he had a good eye on himself, he had a bad eye on others, and then he had no eye on God. I mean, even though he's praying, he still really doesn't have an eye on God. Because if you'll notice in the parable, it starts out that the Pharisee prays, and notice the next few words. It says, he prayed thus with himself. He prayed with himself. He does use the word God in his prayer, but it's really a bragging session. He's really just talking to himself and telling all his good qualities. He's not really connecting with God. You know, you ask any child what prayer is, and they'll say it's talking to God. That's a great definition, talking to God. You can't go wrong with a definition like that. And yet this Pharisee's praying thus with himself. And nowhere in his prayer does he acknowledge his need for mercy, his need for redemption. And all these things underlie the fact that this Pharisee was a self-righteous man of pride. Now let's look at the tax collector. Now in contrast to the Pharisee, the tax collector was a quiet man of humility. And we see this in a couple of ways. One of the ways we see it is in what he said. His humility was expressed in what he said. You can tell a person is humble often by the words that they say. If somebody's always boasting with their words, you know they're not a humble person. But you can often tell a person's humility by what they say. And with this tax collector, there are only seven words recorded of his prayer. And he said, God... Be merciful to me, a sinner. Just those seven words. And those words indicate his humility. He didn't try to impress God. He didn't try to show off. He didn't try to flaunt his good deeds. He just said, Lord, I'm a sinner in need of mercy. His words showed his humility. And when I was growing up, Muhammad Ali was in his heyday. I mean, I remember the rumble in the jungle and the thriller in Manila and all these different fights. He was in the news all the time. He was almost larger than life, one of the, the biggest sports personalities of the 20th century. 
And growing up, if, if you remember Muhammad Ali during that time, anytime there was a microphone in his face, which was often, he would always talk about how he was the greatest. Yeah, I'm the greatest, he'd say. He'd talk about how beautiful he was and all this, and he'd just boast all the time about how great he was. And I was you know, 10, 12, 13, 14 years old as he's in his prime, and I would hear this so often and it just turned me off to Muhammad Ali. I know in a lot of ways he was a good man, and he's often you know, highly respected still today and probably always will be. And I understand looking back now that I'm older and I see his life in perspective, I think a lot of that was probably just showmanship. A lot of it was gamesmanship. He was trying to get into the head of his opponents and all that kind of stuff. But you know, growing up, hearing somebody talk about themselves that way just really turned me off. I'm the greatest, he would say all the time. That was his mantra and Because you can tell about a person, about what they say. And if someone's always talking about themselves, you've known people like that, that are always talking about, I've done this and I do that, and they're always talking about all the great things about themselves, and it just makes you sick, doesn't it? Because their pride is showing through. But when you hear somebody talk in humble ways, it draws you to them. Another way you can tell that this tax collector was humble wasn't just because of what he said, but also because of what he did. It's interesting how Jesus lays this parable out. There, there are a few things this tax collector does that shows that he's humble, not just his words, but what he does. It says, first of all, the tax collector stands afar off. When he got to the temple, he didn't go up front. He didn't look for a place of honor. He wasn't seeking attention. It says he stood afar off. And then it says that he wouldn't even so much as lift his eyes to heaven. And I can imagine him looking down in humility because of his sin. It says he wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven. And then it says he beat his breast, which in Bible times indicated humility and contrition and repentance. And all these things that he did show his humility. Because it's important what we do, because it's possible that someone can speak and sound like they're humble but still have pride in their heart. So it's a combination of what they say and what they do. And here with this tax collector, we see both what he said and what he did indicate his humility. Back in 2004, when Cindy and I were living in the Akron, Ohio area, we went one time to uh, an event where there were hundreds of people there. It was celebrating volunteers in our area. And the speaker that night was the founder of Habitat for Humanity. His name is Millard Fuller. He was a good speaker, and he told a story about Habitat for Humanity's most famous volunteer, which, of course, is former President Jimmy Carter. And this is a story he told. He said, in 1984, Jimmy Carter and his wife, Rosalind, were taking a bus with another group of volunteers to New York. Now, let me pause right here and say this. No former president of the United States ever has to take a bus again as long as they live. I mean, Jimmy Carter and his wife could have flown on a private jet to New York. They could have taken a limo and, and uh, driven in style. But they rode the bus. They chose to ride the bus with the rest of the volunteers. And they were going to New York, and they were going to be working for a, a week or so, and building a house, and they were all going to be staying at a church. It was called Metro Park Baptist Church. Well, they all arrive in New York, and they get off the bus, and the pastor there gathers all the people together, and he wants to give a, a welcome speech to them, just a short speech to, to greet them. And he, he says something like this. He says, I, I want to, first of all, welcome uh, former President Jimmy Carter and his wife Rosalind and all of you volunteers we're kind of a poor church, and we don't have the best and biggest of facilities, but we'll do our best to make you comfortable this week. He said, we have two large rooms, so all the men will stay in one room, and all the women will stay in the other room. If you're married, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to spend the week sleeping in separate rooms. We do, however, have one private room with its own bath, and this week, we're going to call it our presidential suite because we have arranged for President Jimmy Carter and his wife Rosalind to stay in that room this week. 
And he went on with his speech and shared some other thoughts. And when he was done, President Carter went up to him and he said, Pastor, I really appreciate the offer of that room. But we happen to have a newlywed couple with us this week on this trip. And Rosalind and I would like for them to have that room this week. He said, Rosalind and I have been married over 40 years. I think we can manage. I'll never forget that story that Miller Fuller told that night. It just underscored everything about the humility that is Jimmy Carter. It's not just what a man might say, but it's what he does. Jimmy Carter could have taken that room without a second thought. and Nobody would have faulted him for it. After all, he's a former president, but he humbly gave it up for another couple. It's not just what we say, but what we do. And this tax collector and what he did showed his humility. Let us do the same. And one other piece I want to add here as we close concerning the Pharisee and the tax collector. And that is, the tax collector walked away justified, and the Pharisee walked away condemned. And I want to make five statements, kind of like bullet points, just with a little uh, statement added to each one. But some thoughts that come through this story. First of all, the Pharisee shows us that it's possible to pray and not be justified. You know, a lot of people pray during this crisis right now. A lot of people are praying, and that's great. It's great that they're praying. But the Pharisee prayed, but he never sought forgiveness. He never asked for redemption. He never confessed sin. And so he wasn't justified. He wasn't forgiven. A lot of people pray, but never become Christians. A lot of people pray to God and they'll ask for miracles, but they never confess their sin. We need to confess our sin and ask Jesus into our lives. Secondly, the Pharisee was not righteous in God's sight because he was righteous in his own sight. If we consider ourselves righteous in our own sight, then we'll never seek God's forgiveness and ask Him to make us righteous. We have to acknowledge our own sinfulness for God to make us righteous. Number three, how vain is the hope of the person who expects heaven because he's not as wicked as other people? How vain is the hope of the person who expects to go to heaven simply because he's not as wicked as other people? See, the Pharisee thought he was all right because he wasn't as bad as the tax collector. And we don't go to heaven based upon our comparison to others, but upon our relationship with Jesus. Number four, heaven bends low to a soul that sees its need for mercy. And I could just see heaven wrapping its arms around this tax collector. And then number five, the Pharisee's righteousness was so filled with pride that it was rotten. Whereas the tax collector's sin was so bathed in humility that he was right at heaven's gate. Now let me ask you, where are you in this with the Pharisee and the tax collector? Do you see yourself as a pretty good person compared to most others, and because of that you think you're all right and not in need of God's grace or forgiveness? My prayer is that you'll recognize that we're all like the tax collector. We're all, we all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. So humble yourself and ask for God's mercy and forgiveness. A couple of years ago, a man named T.F. Tenney passed away. He's a, a pastor and he had this interesting little commentary on this passage. He said, it's your job to humble yourself. And it's God's job to lift you up. If you do God's job, then he'll do yours. Now, let me say that again. Listen carefully. He said, it's your job to humble yourself, and it's God's job to lift you up. But if you insist on doing God's job, in other words, if you lift yourself up, then God will do your job, and He'll humble you. Just like He did with Nebuchadnezzar, 
just like he did with King Agrippa in the book of Acts, and just like he's done with countless others. Let's humble ourselves, and then let Jesus lift us up by his grace. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you that you lift up the humble. And Father, we pray that you'd help each one of us to see our need for mercy. That because of our sin, we stand in need of forgiveness and grace. Help us, Lord, to confess that to you. And we know that when we do, we will receive it in the name of Jesus. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for worship this week. We are honored that you have spent this time with us, and we want you to know that we send our love to you uh, wherever you may be at this point in time. And not only do we love you, but God, of course, loves you more than we could ever imagine. I want to thank you again for all of you who call this your church home and have been supporting our church financially and being faithful in your stewardship. And we, again, will put up the ways on the screen that you can continue to support us through online giving or through sending a check here to the church. And I hope that uh, those will be helpful uh, in directing you here in the days to come. May the Lord bless you. May you continue to just enjoy his presence throughout the week and know that no matter what this world throws at us, we serve a Lord who is greater than all. He said that in this world we will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world.